A big thank you to our sponsor, iFixit, who fights for your right to repair and makes really cool tools in the process. If you need to fix your phone, laptop, or even a vacuum, iFixit has thousands of parts, tools, and free guides. Mercury, Mercury Stardust. She's a beacon of hope in the darkest night. Mercury, Mercury Stardust. She'll teach you how to make it all alright. Hey there, hi, my name is Mercury, and I'm the trans handy ma'am. My pronouns are she, her, and I teach compassionate DIY. We're here to help renters, LGBTQIA members, and anyone who's feeling left out in a DIY space. Hey guys, gals, and non-binary pals! Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Handy Ma'am Hotline. Now, for those who are just listening to the very first time, typically we have my business manager or my business partner, Maggie Conrad, on the show. However, Maggie Conrad was not able to be here this week because, again, she's very sick. <laughs> So, my wonderful production goblin and one of my best friends in the whole world is filling mm. in for Maggie, and that is the wonderful Beza! Oh, oh that was cute. I like that. Yeah. Every week we have a new sound effect that Matt throws at us, and this week Matt decided a bicycle was good for you. Yeah. I feel like this is where uh, Queen's um, bicycle should play. Okay. I love my bicycle. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Okay, Basil, first yeah. and foremost, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. I've got coffee, so, you know, that's that's always good. I got my Red Bull, we're, we're and doing good I'm thing. ready to answer some cues. Now, oh, yes. for those who don't know, if you're just listening and tuning in for the very first time, I'm going to answer several DIY questions. Now, this week, I did kind of look over some of these, mm-hmm. but I don't have, like, a, I haven't discussed these or haven't went through them. I haven't given them a full... No research. I've done no real research on these. I've touched on a little bit here and there to make sure I was going to give a good answer. But I did, haven't done like a deep dive on these yet. Mm-hmm. So you're going to hear these questions. Basil's going to read the first one off in a second. And you're also going to hear some voiceovers as well throughout the podcast. Now, here's the thing. If you like what you're hearing, you can also get your questions answered by calling this number. Six zero eight two zero five eight seven six eight, and you can also text or call us, and we would do the best we can to help you answer those questions. Okay. Yeah. Now, without further ado, do, Basil, are you ready to read off the first question of the day? Oh, I'm so ready. Let's go. Hey, Mercury and Maggie and Matthew. My name is Jolene, and I'm from Connecticut. My pronouns are she and they. I have a question about attic insulation. My spouse and I purchased a Victorian house about a year ago. And it's a good solid house, but definitely needs some work. We have a walk-up attic. So there's an actual staircase leading from the upstairs hallway up into the attic. And it's really accessible. And I wanted to finish that into another bedroom. Part of the attic is already finished into a little storage space, but the main part is unfinished. It has a solid floor, but you can still see like the rafters and the beams and the plywood that I guess the roof is attached to. It's all just exposed up there. And so I'm hoping to put some drywall up and, you know, insulate that space. Right now, I think what's there is called loose fill insulation. It's kind of this fluffy gray insulation that just, like, sits on the floor. It's about a a foot thick. And so I'm wondering if when I'm putting up the drywall, like, can I just scoop that up and, like, pop it behind there to insulate? Or... Do I have to get rid of all that stuff and, like, put different insulation behind my drywall? And also, I guess I wonder, like, is there a preferred type of insulation for attic spaces? And if we decide to do something like spray foam, is that something a DIYer can do? Or would we have to hire someone to do that for us? Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my question. I really believe in your mission, and I'm so happy that you exist as a resource. Good luck with everything. Thank you so much. Take care. This is such a good question and honestly one that we don't get enough of. Mm. When we're talking about new homeowners and especially ones of older houses, 
we're often talking about addicts. <laughs> we're, mm-hmm. I mean, addicts mm-hmm. are just a, what a fun question to get, right? Like, addicts are basically filled with a full of my nightmares, okay? <laughs> now, Basil, before I jump in, as a professional who's been doing this for 16 years, do you have any input you want to put in here before I fill some people's ears with A's? <laughs> um, I guess I think we should just mention, that I think they said they're in Connecticut, and it gets pretty cold there, doesn't it? Yeah. So I think it'd be important to like really talk about the types of insulation that might be appropriate. Yeah, I mean, often often your attic can be a source of where you lose heat, right? Mm. And we were talking about this off air, but there's something called shadow lines. And when you look at, at the room right below your attic, right, if this is a hallway or if your attic is right above a bedroom, you will sometimes see these darker, almost shadowy lines on your ceiling. Mm-hmm. And that's where your joists are. And your joists, that if they're exposed to the air in your, your attic, mm-hmm. can often get colder than the insulated drywall that's next to it. Mm. Okay? Now... What can happen from that is that that can build up moisture because you get hot right. air down below, mm-hmm. cold air above, and that's onto your your joists, and that can cause some damage into that drywall. So that's something to keep in mind. Even if you got plaster, you can still have damage that can be caused. Mm. So that's something to k- kind of keep in mind when we're talking about this kind of stuff. I always try to tell people that your best bet is to cover up, you know, your your attic floor and make sure there is something down. Even even when we're talking plywood and stuff sure, like that. That's yeah. better than and nothing. Even loose plywood if you just have it in certain mm, places. Mm-hmm. That's better than nothing. You know? I, I also think that when we're talking about this, I would also stay away from spray foam. As we're talking about this right now, that we are also on live right now on TikTok and getting some input in here about this specific question. People are already telling me make sure you can you consult with the um, the city or the town that you live mm. in, and there is there are some regulations that could be with insulation with sure. your home. It all depends. Um, some ha- don't have much at all. Some have a lot of like things you have to meet. Mm. Especially if you have an HOA. You know, if, oh, you, yeah. if you have certain standards you have to meet, there might be something to be mindful of. Now, when we talk about spray foam, to me, it's a waste of money for this specific thing. Mm. I think spray insulation is great for certain installations and certain situations, especially ones that are enclosed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't think this is the route. I don't think this is the route you want to go. I personally believe high-density foam Mm. is the route I would go, right? High-density foam, to me, would be the best solution. It's going to cost a little bit more. High-density foam or high-density insulation is going to be a better bet. They also make the rollout kind. Mm-hmm. The insulation that just rolls out. It almost looks like a little like, like... Like a hay bale. It looks like a hay bale. Yeah, it just rolls right out like a sleeping bag. It oh, just yeah, sure. rolls right out like a sleeping uh-huh. bag, you know? And I think that's that's probably my all-time favorite. Fast, easy, n- uh, fits most of uh, the spaces you're in. Mm-hmm. You might have a little... If you have a Victorian house like... They mentioned you might have a little bit of a problem because it, the joists might be a little bit farther apart than right. the standard nowadays mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or a little bit closer together, depending on what you're dealing with. Right. It, but you might want to think about that. Now, someone said on the live stream, I want to point this out, a sprinkler system might also be required depending on the number of levels in the house. Oh, that's a very true fact. I think no, people in the chat on the live can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's mostly three story buildings that have mm. that. I think three-story buildings typically have a requirement in most major areas in the United States that you need to have a sprinkler system installed wow. now, especially if you're doing any type of updates. Sure. Sometimes you can get grandfathered into right, those kind right. of things, but when you do any type of upgrade, you are usually required by mm-hmm. law to do things like that. So if someone knows anything about that on the live stream, you should comment down below. But all of that being said... We talked about the high density foam. Mm-hmm. We talked about the rollout foam. Mm-hmm. We talked about the fill stuff. Now let's talk about fiberglass. Okay. Because they asked us, are there any specific installations we would do? And the very first thing that came to my mind that is better than that loose stuff mm-hmm. that I just do not like it at all is very much working on the fiberglass. The sure. fiberglass is fairly affordable. Yeah. And not that hard to install. Right. I would say if you're going to have an exposed joist, 
I would say put some on top too, like we were talking about before. You can do that, but just make sure they're not completely exposed. That's going to help you a lot in the long run. But make sure if you're installing any type of foam mm. or removing any type of foam, right, you're going to want to wear long sleeves mm -hmm. with gloves, with a respirator, mm -hmm. and with gl goggles. Yep. Okay, you want to go the full Monty of PPE. Yep. You don't want to sell yourself short this way. Trust me, as someone who has gotten fiberglass on her skin. It is no fun. It is bad. It is bad. Yep. And if you get fiberglass under your shirt or anything like that, it's not fun. No. So wear multiple layers. It's going to be hot. It's going to be awful. You're going to be sticky. Mm -hmm. But that's just the reality of doing this kind of work. Try not to do it in the dead of winter or the uh, or the top of, 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 uh, of summer, right? Mm -hmm. Do it right now before it gets too hot. Yep. Do it right now. In April and May, you're going to be better off. You wait until August, you're, you're going to regret it. You're yeah, going to regret you're going to be it. miserable. You're going to be absolutely <laughs> miserable. Now, how do you remove all that loose foam? Uh, a good, a good old fashioned shop vac mm. is the, probably the best route. Sure, yeah. Again, wear your PPE with it just to make sure. You probably shouldn't have too much problems with that kind of fiber of that type of installation, but it's still loose and it's everywhere and it's a pain. In the right, butt. and there might be like little like pest droppings and things yeah that's you know? true too. There, there's other things in you there are, to be concerned about you are in the attic there's a lot that could be going on in there yep so that would be my route did i answer is that every, did everything good there is there any clarity questions that you want to ask to make sure you properly understand there can we just talk about like why you want to insulate your attic if you live somewhere cold yeah, I mean, it's where a lot of the heat gets lost, right? Like, heat's going to rise, right? And if you have no insulation there, it's going to naturally just go right through the floor and go right through the ceiling and out. Right. You know what I mean? It's going to find the, the point of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And if it's having a hard time getting out elsewhere, the majority it's going to get out wherever it can. Right. Right? And that's when you have, like, you know, a, a, ba a badly insulated or installed window, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. A badly installed door, to be for that matter of fact. Loose floorboards. All those things can cause uh, your heat to be lost through your house. Okay? Don't they make, like, tools that show, like, in colors? Like, you can yep. look around your yep. house? Yeah, the, 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 the little, like, heat finders or yeah. the infrared cameras, mm -hmm. right? Now, the thing is, they make those apps on your phone or sure. those, those little devices that hook on your phone and do it. I don't think they're worth the investment. Okay. I think that a lot of times they're like between eighty to one hundred and forty dollars. Oh, okay. If you've got a friend that has one of them, mm. who's really handy, like I am buying one for the shop eventually. Okay. We down here in the shop, we have a heat problem. Mm -hmm. We have multiple locations that is not properly insulated. Yeah. And the windows were not properly done. And I know that because every once in a while I walk by a window and I could feel yeah. the <laughs> air coming at me, <laughs> and I'm like, oh boy. So, like, we're going to do that because I think it'll be a fun video, but I don't know if I recommend that. Now, I don't know if you can rent those. Like, I don't know if you can go to a Howard Ray store and rent them, but mm. if you can, look into it. That's call, a good idea. Call your Home Depot, call your Lowe's, call your Menards, or whoever else around you. Or if you have, like, a, a tool lending library in if your you city. Have a, if you have a, uh, a tool lending library of any kind, might have an infrared camera. Mm -hmm. It might be worth it. Okay. Now, one last thing I will throw out there before we move on to the next question is someone in the chat brought up a really good um, point is if you have fiberglass on you, don't activate the fiberglass mm -hmm. by putting hot water on you. Mm -hmm. Do cold water. Right. It comes off way easier and it doesn't like activate all the problems with it, right? That's important for tear gas, too. Just just a little... Oh, huh. Hint. Why would you know anything about Cold. that? Oh, <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> okay. All right. All that being said, I think we are going to move on to the next question. Do we feel like we answered all the A's? I think we did great. Oh, we did. Let's go! Next question. Okay. So, our next question here is from Amanda, and she says... Hello, Mercury. My name is Amanda, pronouns she, her. I am a homeowner in Massachusetts, and I'm wondering if you have any tips on painting a basement laundry room cement floor. Thank you so much. Bye. And then there's a follow-up here. The floor is currently unpainted, rough, bare concrete. Some articles recommended beginning with an etching solution, but I'm wondering if that's necessary for my rough, bare floor. I'm also curious if Mercury would recommend a specific paint since it's in a basement and is at risk for water damage if the machine breaks. But we have not had any water issues. I love when people 
ask questions and then do the research. I love that mm-hmm. because I can really tell they put the, Amanda put a lot of time and effort and thought into this. Yeah, they care. So Amanda, way to go. If you have rough flooring, do you need etching solution? Etching solution is typically used when you got a smooth concrete floor because it's 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 going to repel it, right? Like okay. if you put paint on it, it's just not going to hold it. it so typically when you paint anything, regardless if you're painting concrete, wood, drywall, anything, mm-hmm. you want it to be able to be opened up, but you want it to be like dry and ready to accept the paint. Right. If the the surface is like it has a sheen to it, or if it has a, some type of like like even like it, it, if it's all smooth essentially, mm-hmm. it might not take the the paint well. Sure. Right? If you Let's just say you pull carpet off a of concrete, right? And it's just full of adhes- adhesion. Mm. You will then use a stripper of some kind, like zip stripper or whatever you got. Sure. And you will leave it soaked for like eight si- or six to eight hours or whatever it is. And then you can scrape it all off, mm-hmm. right? Now, typically, that concrete is already going to be beat the shit. And you don't necessarily, especially if you're not stripped, you don't have to typically add an etching solution. Because okay. etching solution is just putting a little bit of adhesion to it. Okay. It's basically just grabbing onto it. Now, without knowing how rough and gritty your floor is, mm-hmm. I'm going to say you should absolutely put etching on it. Sure. All right? I don't know how smooth this is. I don't know how truly rough this is. And chances are it's not rough enough. If it's rough in some spots and not all spots, you should use etching solution. Right. And every time I looked this up, I, I looked it up a little bit before the podcast, Every single place told me etching and cleaning solutions, mm. right? Now, Rust Aluminum has a product. Um, Zip had a product. A bunch of different companies had a product. Sure. I think you should find something that works best for you. Really make sure you do the due diligence about researching the specific products, Amanda. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But then I th- also think, just to throw this one out there, if you do have rough concrete, when you are rolling it off, when you're rolling the paint off, I would say you want to get a cover for your roller that has a nap of like half inch or more. Okay. Do you know what I'm saying, Baze? Yeah, like the the plushness of of the roller. Yeah, the plushness? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, like the little squishiness of yeah, it, right? Right. But yeah, like all rollers, all roller covers have a different what they call a nap. So mm-hmm. it's like a thickness, mm-hmm. right? Quarter inch, all the way to like a one inch or two inch nap, sure. right? Now, if you're dealing with anything rough, the squishier it is, the more it's gonna get into all the crevices. Oh sure, yeah. Right. But the more squishy it is, the more paint it's going to hold. Right. And the more chances you're going to have runs. Mm -hmm. Or, in this example, puddles. Okay. If you're doing floors, you want to really make sure you get just the right amount of thickness. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, go go, get two different sizes. They're not that much money. Right. The covers are worth it. You'll always find a way to use different covers. You'll always find. Trust me. And I think you want to start, like, at a half inch. And then a three quarters and then an inch. Okay. Right? Well, just give it a try mm-hmm. and see if you like it. Chances are a half inch is not going to be thick enough. A quarter inch is going to be right. Gotcha. But I wouldn't jump to an inch because that's when you're going to have little puddles and then it's going to be a nightmare. Mm. Okay? Uh, I think I answered it all. Did I miss anything? Um, Did I miss anything, Basil? I think we Oh, got specific it. paints? Um, oh, Bear. Bear. Bear is the one I recommend the most. It's B-E-H-R. Um, Bear is a decent... So they got a ba- the, the thing I like about Bear is that they got a little bit of everything. Mm. And it's hard to go wrong with them. Like if you recommend Bear, they're kind of in the middle of the field. They're not usually the most sure. expensive, but they got a product for almost basically everything. Mm-hmm. And I can at least say as a technician, you're safer with Bear than you are with other products. Sure. Right? Okay. Now like Dutch Boys, I don't know if they have any good concrete. Like I haven't worked with them enough. But I know I've worked with Bear in a lot of different types of projects, and I haven't necessarily had too much of a problem with Bear. Okay. So I, I would say that, but I'm sure there's better options. Sure. You know sure. what I mean? Like, I'm sure there's other more effective options. I think when we're talking about concrete, depending on how much of the finish you want, like, mm. depending on how good of a finish you want, you can get away with a cheaper one. Yeah, sure. Just be aware you might have to put on two coats. Mm. Okay. You know what I mean? Because Bear is pretty fucking good when it comes to thickness. You you can get away with like one or two coats. You might need to do a third if you do a cheaper paint, right? Mm-hmm. Because sometimes they're more watery. Right. That's where the cheapness comes from. They're yeah. more watery and, and 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 diluted. But yeah, I think that's my hot take on that. I I I think ultimately 
concrete floors are not that hard. But make sure you get a good uh, extending roller to mm, like a good yeah, arm. That's a good point. Yeah, I, I I like getting a good arm that's metal. I don't like the wood ones. The wood ones, the cheaper ones you get will snap too. Sure. The more connections they have, the more likely they are to snap in half too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So make sure you get the ones that extend out and the ones that clip and stuff are fine. But I think you're better off to get the ones that are like, you know, like all in one and just twist and go instead of like. There's a button that, that that makes it longer. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I think if you're like you're working on your hands and knees too, like maybe for corners, like get get some knee pads. Like honestly, oh, get the knee pads. Get some knee pads. Or or for a concrete, you can get away with an extension for a tool brush too. Like you can get a tool brush for a paintbrush. You can get a you can like you can just duct tape the damn thing around your handle. <laughs> sure. Yeah. That, oh, when we're talking about concrete, you don't the precision doesn't have right. to be there as well as it is others. Yeah. It all depends what you're going for. Mm-hmm. Whatever mm-hmm. you're going for. But I think that's it. I think that's I think we covered basically everything. I think everything else should be good for you, Amanda. Yeah. I hope that that covered all of your cues. Good luck and send us some pictures when you finish it. And that brings us to a brand new segment called Things That Impress Your Friends at a Dinner Party. Yes! Now, we all have things. When we go to a dinner party, we all encounter different things that stress us out, right? Right. Now, many times when we go to dinner parties, we might be around people who don't know us, Mm -hmm, right? And that mm -hmm. can be kind of scary. Yeah. Now, as a handy person... I have developed ways to impress people I don't know Mm -hmm. to make them think that I'm cool. (laughs) (laughs) And one of those things um, is the magnet to find a a stud. Yeah. Okay. Now, there is nothing. (laughs) I will. I won so many bets in my (laughs) life by just grabbing a magnet off of a fridge and finding a stud with it. Uh huh. And I got to tell you, if, if, if you are at a dinner party, First, I would try to make sure that you can do this with a wall before you impress right, your friends. Right, try it out first. If you're a little bit tipsy-wipsy, and then you're like, hey, everybody, I can use this magnet to find a stud, and then you can't find a stud, <laughs> 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 you, might, you might not win the bet, right. you know? But a stud can be used to find the screws that are holding up the drywall onto the wood beam, which is called a stud, mm-hmm. behind your wall. Right. Okay? Now... Typically, the head of a screw is much smaller. So I would invest in something like a stud pop, which is the wonderful mm-hmm. little invention that we have promoted before. Love that them. I love the stud pop. It's a great little device. It's only $10. Even works through tile. Even looks for tile. But if you have a pretty good high-powered magnet, like a good fridge magnet, not like one of those like plastic flimsy ones. Right. Not those ones that have like a letter attached to mm-hmm. it. You know, like a little bit stronger than that. If you have one of the good ones right. and you slide it on the wall back and forth, you will find a screw on the wall mm-hmm. that is holding up the drywall onto the wood beam. Right. And that is fucking impressive. Yeah. That will f- make people freak out. Okay? <laughs> the only covenant to that, you have to tell people that you learned it from the trans handyman. <laughs> All right? Uh, you got to make sure that you tell that to people. That's an old carpenter trick, and many people who follow me, they follow me for that specific reason mm-hmm, because they follow mm-hmm. me through that hack. But yeah, that's my that's my tidbit for the day. What do you think? Have you done that and to impress people yet? I have not done that yet, but you know I'm definitely going to. Yeah, when you're on your first date, Oh, that's what you should do. Mm. That's what you okay. should do. When you're on when you're on your first date with it, with, with your next boo, you need <laughs> you need to be like, hey, do you know how to find a stud? And there's going to be some type of joke that happens there, uh, right? Of you're like, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you how to find a stud, and you just whip a magnet out and find a stud on the wall. <laughs> that would be pretty good. Or better yet, you know where the the screw is on the wall, and you just take the magnet and you just throw it in the wall. Oh, oh, oh. that would be hot. That would be smooth. That would be hot. <laughs> but it, you, it would look pretty stupid if it bounced off the wall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you impress friends at a dinner party. Yeah. Now, all that being said, let's go back to the questions and get to the next question of the day. Yeah. Hi, Mercury. My name is Amanda. My pronouns are she, her. I currently rent a house from my dad, and he's been, you know, whenever there's been an issue with the house, he would help take care of it the kind of person that, you know, can fix everything ever. At the moment, though, he's currently in the hospital. I can't really bother him with this, and so I don't really know what to do. But 
we live in a townhouse, we have an end unit, and we have, like, part of a fence in our backyard. So where, like, the, the very back of it that would be parallel to the back of the house isn't fenced in, but the sides are, and one side is starting to fall down. And I can send a picture if you need it or anything like that, but I'm just trying to find out how to fix this since I can't really ask my dad to help me fix that right now, and I can't really afford to have someone come in and do it. So, yeah, any help would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Bye. Hey, Amanda, I hope you're doing good. I can tell that this is kind of like a frustrating thing because, hey, I hope your dad is okay in the hospital right now. I hope that everything's going good. And I know that this kind of stuff, especially when we're dealing with things as large as a fence, Mm -hmm. can be like really fucking stressful, right? Fences are big uh, and they're a a structure that can cause some major, you know, headache, Mm -hmm. right? The the, the answer to this, though, is you got to repost it. Like, and what, when we say repost it, we mean take it out, take them out, and redo it if you want them, or take them out com- all together. If the fence is falling down, there isn't much you can do structurally that's going to be safe, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I think you need to detach everything and then take them right out. Mm-hmm. That would be the route that I would go. We also, like, you, you talk about how the fence is falling over. So maybe you can detach it from a, like the, the the areas that it's most problematic, mm-hmm. and then repost them into the ground. Okay, if that's not a solution, if if the soil is too soft and 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 it isn't compounded, right? If the soil is too loose, mm. your next route is to dig a hole, put a a bucket or something down in in that hole, mm-hmm. put concrete down in there. Like a uh, quick concrete, quick cement, mm-hmm. and then you put a post in there, right? And boom, you're good to go. Do you know what I mean? Like that—that that is the most. That's the farm girl in me mm-hmm. telling you that's how you repair that kind of shit. Mm-hmm. But that is usually a solution that will hold pretty. That's what we did in the farm, right? Whenever we had, you know, we had bad soil, mm-hmm. if we had things that did not go the way we needed to. This was the thing we did quick and easy and just moved on Mm -hmm. because you often don't have a whole lot of time. Right. You know what I mean? I've also, I think I've seen that a lot here. Like, you know, we live on an isthmus where the the ground can be kind of like watery, like kind of. Yeah. We have solid. So so we live technically in a wetland, right? Like we live in Madison is basically everything is wet all the fucking time. Mm -hmm. Like we live in an area that sinks yeah <laughs> you it know? literally does and it wouldn't surprise me to have like you know water underneath the ground and, and all those kind of issues mm-hmm. that cause that soil to be so you know not great for farmland but for this instance concrete would be the best route now amanda this is a very amanda heavy show by the way <laughs> amanda i don't know for sure what your soil looks like or what you have for resources mm-hmm. so my suggestion like if the fence is only on both sides and it's not like a it's not really fencing anything in it's just there to be there or maybe it's there for sound reasons mm. but sometimes it's there to trap sound or re- sure. to keep sound out i don't know I, I have no idea but from what i can tell from the information you have given us i think that it's worth you know consulting your neighbors giving their input and then taking it down mm. and taking at least the section that's coming down right until you can come up with a better solution because you don't want to have the thing that it, it, it collapses on, God forbid, anyone or anything, right? Right, yeah. You know, and I also don't know how tall this fence right, is. Right, yeah. Right? Like, if you're talking to, like, a an 8-foot fence or a 6-foot... Like foot, a privacy fence. Yeah, <laughs> privacy. I mean, yeah, a 10, 12-foot fence. Uh, you know? But also, if it's that big, well, yeah, then you need to ha- repost it. Absolutely. It's hardcore. Yeah. You know? I Yeah, I think that's what I got here. Do you got anything you want to you throw in there? Basically. Um, just that, you know, this is, this is going to be a big project, but you know, I don't think it's going to be too difficult. Like they're not that expensive. It's yeah. just really time consuming. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I, 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 with these kind of projects, they're not expensive as much as they are labor intensive. Yeah. They are, they are <laughs> a little bit intense when you're doing this kind of work, but definitely get extra help, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Three pairs of hands for a fence makes for better work than doing it by yourself or one right. other person. Three, you might not need a third person the whole time, but boy, when you need them, you need them. Mm-hmm. So keep that in mind. I hope that helps. Okay, let's go on for the last question of the day. Hi, Mercury. 
I have a question. My name is Danielle, and I live in Seattle, Washington. My pronouns are she, her. My bedroom that I moved into is painted black with splatter paint all over the walls. I'm trying to figure out what's going to be the best way to cover this up. Should I try to paint over it? But then I worry about things like having the texture of the splatter paint. I thought maybe wallpapering it. Or should I just rehang the drywall completely? Thanks. I'm looking at this painting, and this looks like a Jack uh, Pollock. This looks like a Pollock painting. Oh, yeah. Doesn't it? Like, yeah, right? Jacqueline <laughs> P- Pollock? Is that what the name is? I'm not an art major. My spouse is, okay? My spouse is a master in art history. I don't know <laughs> shit. I, w- I want to make that very clear. But I'm looking at this this right now, and there is like about three different layers Mm-hmm. of splatter paint there's a yellow there's a green there's a blue yeah and they're all overlapping each other and then there's drizzle there's drizzle all over the wall mm-hmm. it looks like a waterfall and then right in the center there is another paint it's a gray paint that's like a heart shape so you have very instinctive paint marks on the wall that are adding layers but that consistent layer right what do you do in this instance now they brought up the very, you know, obvious answer is rehanging your drywall. That's an extreme answer. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say you have to do that route. Now, what I would do is a skim coat of joint compound on the wall. Okay. Okay. Now, instead of peeling this all off, which is not going to happen, right? <laughs> right. This is, you're not going to get this to work. No. All right. But what you can do is a skim coat. And a skim coat is. When you get a bunch of joint compound, you're gonna need a, like a, a a good a good hefty amount. You're gonna need like a two buckets full, two big buckets, and you're gonna want to get a tray, and then like a ten to twelve inch joint compound knife or blade. Okay. Now, if you haven't done joint compound before, it might be a little difficult, but I'm telling you right now, you're gonna be way happier down the road, because all it is is a skim coat is a thin layer of mud. Kind of like when you're rolling off a wall with paint mm. over the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Now, that mud, it might show through, like the color might show through, but the texture is going to be gone. Right. And the texture is the part we're trying to get rid of, yep. right? You're basically just trying to make sure that from head to toe, from head all, all the top to all the way to the bottom of the floor, that there's a nice, thin, consistent layer. Now, you might have a line. That's all that's being overlapped sure. on all of it, right? Like it looks like we got like a ten foot wall. Like Something a width, like that, yeah. A width is like ten foot, maybe maybe less on there. You're gonna want to make sure that you overlap each section. Like if you're taking it from the ceiling to the floor, mm-hmm. you wanna go one section and then overlap like an inch or two. Mm-hmm. Then go down another section and feather it off where the hard point of the blade is always away from the previous section. Okay, yeah. So you're making a line straight down, and you're feathering off the other side. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. Yeah, and then you do that all the way across until you get to the other side of the wall. Right. And that's a muddy, difficult job Mm -hmm. and a little back-breaking, but Mm. that would be the ideal solution to this. Right. Right? Ripping the whole thing out and putting drywall is a is definitely a choice. It, it's it, it's the one that could work, but that's a big job, and you're going to need to mud it anyway. Right. Yeah. Right. So I think skim coating it, and, and basically to be clear, skim coating is a thin layer of mud. Mm-hmm. You're not adding a ton of mud. You're adding enough to be like to p- put pressure on it to make it. You can even look up on on YouTube, and you'll see skim coat joint compound. Okay. And you should get other things that will help, okay? Now, the other suggestion I would throw out there, when you're doing all this, you need to make sure that you cover everything on the floor. Mm. That mud will come out, but if you got carpet, you're kind of not in a great place. Yeah. So make sure you even, you, you take that, the the frog tape or the painter's tape, and you angle it mm-hmm. uh, in a way that's going to make sure that it's going to, like, dispel all of the mud that hits the thing off onto the ground rather right. than into the baseboard or into the yeah. trim. Yeah. And then the last part I will say that someone just asked me on our live stream, can you explain feathering off? Okay. Before I go into the next session, we'll say whenever I say feathering off from either mud or from painting, 
when you were let, let's say well, you're you're editing a picture online, right? And you're editing a picture online and you're doing copying and pasting, right? There's a technique called feathering off. And that means all of the edges that you have are now a little bit more transparent. More transparent. Not all of it, not all of it is. But just like maybe you and if you have like if you're just cutting your body out of a, a photo, you can feather off the edges, mm-hmm. which means you're making the, the head a little lighter and the, the, the your shoulders a little bit lighter and more blended into. So there's no hard edges. Yeah, so there's no hard edges. Exactly, Basil. Exactly. Now, that same thing applies to paint and mud. Mm-hmm. When, you're, when we're talking about going in one direction, the direction that we're going in is hard lines. Mm-hmm. The direction that we're going away from is less pressure, which means feathering off and making it a little bit more of a consistent blend between the previous section right. of mud mm-hmm. and the newest section of mud. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of hard to explain through audio, but there's a lot of tutorials online that will give you more and then come back, listen to this section. Mm-hmm. And then together, you should be able to fill in the gaps of what we're trying to speak on. And it's a technique that I think that can be done by people. Now, if this doesn't work, there's one more solution you could do other than rehanging the drywall. Scraping sand. Mm. Scraping sand. Oh, boy. Get those joint knives. Get that joint knife, that six-inch joint knife, and scrape the shit out of that and sand that down with it over the sander. And prepare for dust to be everywhere in your get whole life. Get a respirator. Life. Get a respirator. Get a respirator. Yes. And get goggles and yes. all the, the, the kit and caboodle. Definitely a messy job. Mm-hmm. If you ever want to know how to say now In this instance, you're not going to have this luxury. Because you're this is too big of a job to do this to. But if you ever are sanding and you're in a space where you can't have dust in the air or you need to have limited dust in the air, there's something called wet sanding. Oh. You can take a sanding block, mm-hmm. soak it in water, okay. rinse it, and then go over the area, right? You're not going to get far, but go over the area. That will suck up the dust sure. as you're sanding it. Okay. Then go back in there and then squeeze it and rinse and repeat. Now, if you're using joint compound, you mm. don't, in a joint com- and only joint compound, this won't, what I'm about to tell you won't work on 30 minute one 90 minute one or hot mud five minute mud it won't work because it's too hard and it's not gonna feather the same way but if you're using joint compound and you're trying to feather off the sides of like a new patch or a hole or anything like that take a rag rinse it out now that wet rag is going to remove the edges Mm -hmm. of that mud now go very lightly right but that could also do it now in this instance we're talking about sanding this down specifically they also make sanding blocks that collect dust, mm. and make sure you get yourself a nice little dust collector for your orbiter sander. Sure, and yeah. you're gonna need to do, go through a lot of grit. You're gonna mm. need to go through a lot of pads yep. for your sander to make sure that you can do that. That's a big one. It's a big one. I gotta say though, it's a cool effect. Yeah, it's a cool effect. It's it's very Seattle, honestly. It's a very <laughs> Seattle thing. Yeah, it looks. It reminds me of uh, my my bedroom as I had as a teenager. I used spray paint on the walls. <laughs> Oh, really? Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, boy. That's fun. You know, if you're ever trying to cover up spay print, uh, there is a product called Kills, oh. K-I-L-L-Z, that is specifically for like almost like a lacquer almost. Okay. But like it goes on a wall and cover up stands. Oh. So like, is it, there's like they, they make a good primer that will do all that. Mm-hmm. So like that helps to keep it hidden. So maybe hit that. Like if you get one area that has like spray paint. Go over it two times with kills with that primer, and then that should be enough. You don't need to go do the whole wall with two coats, but just that one full coat of primer in the whole wall, and then right back over that again with the kills, and that usually does it. That's what we did in property. Gotcha. That's we usually were able to seal it, mm-hmm. and if not, then your next bed is just saying the shit out of that down. And no matter which route you go, before you go to paint the wall again we should be priming first right yeah you should always prime yeah especially the more cardboard you remove the more you should use primer because you have that you know you want to make sure you seal it nice and tight right and extra points if you get mold or mildew resistant Mm, primer right Mm -hmm. extra point for that and bear has a good product for that as well now that we're talking about products and things that you should have all of that being said i think we answered all the cues of the day 
I feel pretty good about it. Oh, Gazel, yeah. how do you feel? Oh, so good. We feel so good. Mean Bagel, I have killed it today. <laughs> We're really happy about it. I want to say thank you to everyone who called into the podcast today or text us. Remember, you too can get your questions answered by calling this number. 608-205-8768. So thank you so much for everyone who did that today. It means a lot to me. Also, remember this. My book is available for pre-order right now. That's Safe and Sound, A Renter's Friendly Guide to Home Repair. We are trying to sell 100,000 books by August 29th of this year Mm -hmm. we are currently as we're recording this at about fourteen thousand. i'm telling you right now i'm telling you right now we're trying to prove a point we are trying to prove a point to uh the publishers and to uh, everyone else in this field that we need to be able to get in access to people Mm -hmm. and we need help to sell these books i mean we also these conversations about renters and mm-hmm. trans people mm-hmm. should be had in a lot of ways. Yes. So make sure you pre-order your book to help us prove a point. Make sure you get me on that New York's best-selling list definitively. Yes. We already think we are, but we want to be definitely on the New York best-selling list. So please help us sell 100,000 books by August 29th. Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to this week's podcast. And as always, remember, you're worth the time it takes to learn a new skill. Bye-bye. The theme song for the Handyman Hotline was written by Rody Walker. The questions were picked out by our production assistants, Ray and Basil. And the sound was engineered by Matthew Allen Hag. Thank you for listening. See you next time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Handyman Hotline, you can listen to an even longer version by supporting us on Patreon. If you support us on Patreon, $10 or more, you'll be able to get an extra long 30 to 45 minute section every single week. Isn't that amazing? More of me and Maggie. Wow! So thank you so much for all those who already support us, and you too can support us and listen to more on our Patreon. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this episode, please help us keep the pirate ship alive by supporting our sponsors, the wonderful iFixit. They fight for your right to repair and makes really cool tools in the process. If you need to fix your phone, laptop, or even a vacuum, iFixit has thousands of parts, tools, and free guides to make your life a little bit easier. So grab your hammer and nails and paint your nails if you want to. You're worth the time it takes to be you. She'll teach you how to fix your house, how to fix it by yourself. The trail.